Right, listen up, because we've got a TikTok now, and it's absolutely imperative that you follow us on it now. Right now, pause the video, follow us on TikTok, and then come back. If you don't, the person who stands behind Ben will grow an extra three inches. Just warning you. Starting off the news this week, a rather wonderful study on, and I quote, the first systematically documented case of active wound treatment with a plant species known to contain biologically active substances by a wild animal. That quote is slightly edited to omit a typo in the study's abstract. The wild animal in question was a male Sumatran orangutan called Rachus, and this fascinating behaviour was observed back in the summer of 2022. Rackus had some sort of injury to his right cheek, believed to have been sustained while fighting rival males. Three days later, while being observed, the great ape selectively pulled leaves of a woolly vine plant called Akbar Kuning. He then chewed on the leaves of the plant and, after chewing so much that it formed a paste, applied this poultice to his injury. Given the length of the time this process took and how specific the application was, the team behind the study are totally confident that Rackus was doing this for medicinal purposes. In addition, the Akar Kuning plant does not usually form a part of the Sumatran orangutan's diet. The plant itself has medicinal properties. It can help treat inflammation and can help protect against bacterial infection. It has been used in traditional medicine as a treatment for dysentery, diabetes, malaria, and more. You'll be pleased to know that the wound on Rackus's face was fully closed after eight days. It's worth noting that behaviour like this has been observed before, but this is the first time a paper published on such an observation has detailed the progress of the wound healing after treatment and what the plant actually does. A brilliant development in our understanding of some of the most complex and clever animals to roam our planet. In other news, we have yet another story from Venus, as a study published in the journal Nature has taken a look at why it is so lacking in water. Despite its similar size and makeup to our own planet, Venus is a particularly dry planet, suggesting that at some point during its 4.5 billion year old life, it lost a rather large amount of its water content to outer space. The study found that even more water is still leaving Venus's steam-rich atmosphere every day than we previously thought. Previous studies have pointed towards a process called hydrogen or hydrodynamic outflow to explain the very heavy water loss that Venus has experienced. But this study looked to find another reason for water leaving Venus as quickly as it has done over its lifetime. Looking at what's leaving Venus's atmosphere today and just how fast that is happening, the team criticised previous research for omitting a process called HCO plus disassociative recombination. It is this process that led the researchers to come to the conclusion that Venus was losing double the amount of volcanic water than previously thought, and they say that these calculations added to other processes like hydrogen outflow do account for the previously baffling amount of water that has historically left Venus's atmosphere. The study calls for future missions to Venus to focus on being able to measure escaping hydrogen and HCO plus as part of their craft's operational capabilities. So then, another study that looks to widen our understanding of how Venus came to be, the planet it is today, and why it differs so much from Earth. And indeed, another study that looks to future missions to further the understandings that have been made by their own research. Up next, we have the latest report on Brave Little Hunter, the orca calf that had been trapped for over a month in a lagoon off the west coast of Vancouver Island. Currently, she is still in Esperanza Inlet and has yet to enter the open ocean. Brave Little Hunter managed to escape the lagoon on her own after attempts to lure her out or capture her in sea nets were unsuccessful. On leaving the lagoon, this determined young orca sped her way towards the open ocean but is now hanging around the mouth of the inlet. The Ihatasut First Nation people who have been involved in caring for her have fears that during her time in the lagoon, she may have become used to people and boats, which could 
put her in danger and disrupt her finding her family. The Fisheries Department and the Ihattasut First Nation have been monitoring the location of Brave Little Hunter and patrolling the area she is now in, which has had which has quite a lot of boat traffic. It has been reported that there have been a couple of encounters with boats already and they are asking any boaters who see her to change course to avoid her and not to stop to watch her or engage with her at all. The Ahatasut First Nation and the Marine Mammal Research Unit have now increased patrols in the area by boat, drone and helicopter in a bid to prevent contact with boaters and so become further habituated to people or boats. There have been reports of a pod of orcas of the northwest coast of Vancouver Island, near Koikot, but they are quite a way offshore and sadly they can't hear her calls. At least there is a lot of food around for her and she has been observed chasing otters, but there is no information at this time as to whether she is actually managing to catch anything to eat. We can only hope that she can survive until she meets up with a pod and that they accept her into their family. If you would like to hear more about Brave Little Hunter's story, then Ben's mum has a video on her channel One World about the events leading up to her escape from the lagoon and the family that she has waiting for her. First up in this week's paleontology news, a new species of prehistoric mammal has been discovered that lives just after the asteroid impact that wiped out all the non-bird dinosaurs. It was fairly small, about the size of a chinchilla, and lived about 610,000 years after the mass extinction. It's been named Militocodon lidae, and is known from a partial skull and a partial jaw uncovered at a site in Colorado. Militocodon was most likely omnivorous, and is a member of the extinct mammal family Peritychidae, meaning it's a kind of very early archaic hoofed mammal related to all living hoofed mammals and whales. The peritychids rapidly diversified after the asteroid impact, and so Mylotogodon adds to the known diversity of these ancient mammals and contributes to our understanding of the complex evolutionary history of these animals, as well as showing how the mammals quickly recovered after the destruction of the Cretaceous mass extinction. Also in the recent paleontology news, some very intriguing research has been published on the biomechanics of the canines of the saber-toothed cat Smilodon, which suggests that it may have actually have had double saber teeth. By investigating the bending strength and stiffness of the saber teeth of Smilodon at various different growth stages using digital 3D models, it was found that these teeth were optimized for increased bending strength as more of the tooth erupted. However, while the teeth were gradually erupting, they were vulnerable to breakage due to lateral forces. This is where the double saber hypothesis comes in, as digital simulations showed that if the baby canines were retained in the mouth while the adult canines grew, they would act like a sort of mechanical buttress and would stabilize the sabers. This double saber stage is hypothesized to have lasted for around 30 months, while the long adult canines continuously erupted, and may have also have provided a sort of safety net for younger cats as they learned how to hunt and wield their deadly teeth without breaking them. This hypothesis is supported by the unusual occurrences of two teeth occupying the same sockets in a few skulls recovered from the La Brea Tar pits, in which an adult sabre can be seen in the process of erupting and slotting in a groove on the baby tooth. This same stabilization mechanism may have also have been present in other saber-toothed mammals which convergently evolved this type of dentition, as skulls of other saber-tooths have been found that have a full set of adult teeth except for the canines, which are still baby teeth, therefore indicating that the baby teeth were retained for a long time. It's a fascinating hypothesis that does seem to make a lot of sense, and double saber-toothed cats are a pretty cool idea. And finally for the Paleo News is the very exciting announcement that a new species of Archaeopteryx has been acquired by the Field Museum in Chicago. Archaeopteryx is an incredibly significant animal, being found at sites in Germany and providing some of the first fossil evidence that birds are dinosaurs, as well as historically being a key transitional fossil that helped to confirm Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection. Fossils of this amazing species are very rare, and if you've watched the recent Boneheads video about Ben and the crew's trip to Germany, you may remember that they got to see five of the known specimens, including number 12, which 
at the time, was the most recent specimen to be put on display. Well, Chicago now has Archaeopteryx 13, which is a beautiful, almost complete skeleton and skull. This is now the first Archaeopteryx specimen to be housed in a public institution outside of Europe and it came from a private collection in Switzerland, where it had previously been removed from Germany before a ban on exporting Archaeopteryx specimens from the country was introduced. It took a couple of years of negotiating for the Field Museum to acquire the specimen, and then, when they at last got it, preparators had to spend another two years removing the rest of the rock matrix from the skeleton, eventually exposing this wonderfully complete skeleton. So, another amazing addition to the known fossil record of Archaeopteryx. Well, that's it for this week's 7 Days of Science. I do hope you enjoyed, and as always, we'll see you on Sunday.